Okay, so we should start another talk. The topic of this talk is scaling up aggregated logging and metrics on OpenShift container platform presented by Ricardo Lorenzo and Elvel Kurik. So uh, welcome to our talk. Uh, so we are part of the performance and scale team. Uh, me and my colleague Elko, we work, uh, we are more for the performance side. And then we have uh, a bunch of, let's say, schedule experts and scalability experts, like consulting. And we all work together to, uh, let's say, improve scalability of OpenShift. Uh, so we, we test on AWS, KVM, uh, OpenStack, different kinds of setups. And uh, we try and squeeze every, every ounce of performance from the, from the product. So as I was saying, we, we usually, our approach usually is like to go for individual components, testing, uh, testing them for limits. Then we try installing them uh, at larger scales in bigger clusters, like 200 nodes, 100 nodes, 200, 500, up to 1,000. I think it was the limit, 1,000 nodes we did. Uh, so first, w we have tools to, to stress both the control plane, like the API server, uh, the ATCV, uh, the scheduler, and the kubelets running on all the nodes. And then we, we kind of build our own tools as, as, as necessary, like, log, like logging in this case is a through, throughput test, is more to test the underlying system, which is another distributed system. So we have like OpenStack, then we have OpenShift on OpenStack, for example, and inside OpenShift we have Elasticsearch, which is the logging stack, which is itself like, uh, well, memory database, and analytics engine, with a lot of things to analyze as well. So like, like I was saying, the components, like for logging it, are Elasticsearch, Kibana for the web UI, mm -hmm. and FluentD, which is the collector, node collector, pod collector, and log collector, and sends, send the data to Elasticsearch for analysis. Then on the metric side, Elko will explain better how it works, but it's Cassandra, Hipster. We also have, we do like more focused benchmarks on the components like Java and Ruby because these are like processes running on the containers and we try to understand what's happening uh, inside the containers. So just a bit of, a bit of background on the, the logging stack. Uh, it's, it's, it's used to collect statistics or information, login information, either security information like access or whatever is happening inside the, the pods in, the, in your cluster. And like I said, it's already a distributed system by itself, so uh, it's, it's, it's usually generating traffic between the, 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 the nodes in themselves. Like Elasticsearch has a master, master nodes, data nodes, it has, uh, it has to deal with the replication between the data, like shard replication and routing and uh, making sure the data is consistent, et cetera, et cetera. So it collects logs from node services, all containers in the cluster. And it's deployed where usually the Elasticsearch pods are deployed in the region infra nodes. So these are the infrastructure nodes. Th these are, they are, deployed using labels and node selectors and most, well, daemon sets as well, which I'll explain a bit better later. FluentD gathers log entries and feeds them into Elastic. So this is the part which like, this triggers the daemon sets and uh, uses a different kind of label. So this is how you, in a, in a large enough cluster, you can, doesn't need to be large, but for larger clusters, this is more important because then you, you can, uh, define where exactly the, the, 
the pods are going to land in your cluster. Which region? Primary, infra, in this case, infrafluent D. It's the one used. And Kibana is the UI where you have uh, like web browsing, you can visualize your logs, you can build dashboards, like makes, try to make sense of the data. So usually people don't run into issues until they reach a certain scale, right? They don't, they don't run into problems. Uh, if you have a 20 node cluster, I mean, for us, it's, it's, it's quite normal, it's quite small. I mean, it's, it's where, when we start to have our baseline, we need also always a kind of a baseline to test against so that we know like the system is, is behaving like in a normal cluster and we, we, get, we get performance data at a quiescent state, like at rest, just with the logging pods up and running and the infrastructure pods up and running. We do this for one hour as rep recommendation by Elasticsearch so because uh, it's it's a way of checking. One hour is, would be enough time to check for any indices operations like some garbage collection cycles, some or some other things that can happen with, in memory in the cluster. One thing that we run into a lot. Once we reach like 200 nodes, it's very common, or used to be, because we already mitigated this. Uh, was the rate limit by default in the OpenShift master of max requests in flight. Used to be 400, then it was bumped to 500. This basically, this is a, a software throttle that takes care of rate limiting the long-running long connections to the API server, which in this case for logging specifically, uh, the Fluentes uh, are, are the, the main connectors to the API server. They, so as it says, it's it, the Fluent D talks to the API server to have to get metadata about the pod, like in which host is running, uh, its name, etc., its uh, project, its namespace, right? This is why, I mean, this is the, the bulk of Kubernetes, right? Metadata about what's happening in the cluster. So the, open ch the nodes themselves also talk to the API server for command and control. <coughs> networking, the networking uh, also, uh, I don't know, In I just placed it there, I don't know specifically what does the, S the SDN does, but I mean, how it consumes this, uh, how it uses this, uh, the, these watches to the API server, but uh, so. One thing we noticed is that when we really want to scale up, like let's say 800,000 nodes, we, we just have to disable this. We have to get rid of this throttle. We set it to zero and we start like with our tests, per, per, like any, any kinds of tests. So. Uh, so, I just have this here for a, like, th as a reference. So, <coughs> replication controllers are important for w when you want to make sure that you have your system in a desired state, right? In, it's like when you do OC run, and you run a pod, and it pulls the image, uh, this pod is running, but it's not being controlled uh, unless you use a replication controller and deployment config, right? It's, it's the replication controller uh, makes sure that, you know, if you want, for this example, we will have three, lab, three exact replicas of Engine, NGINX running. Uh, <coughs> and this is, this is the, the replication controller is, is handling this. I've added a note about daemon sets because most people confuse or there, there is some confusion about like, What's, what, what are some of the difference between daemon sets and replication controllers? The daemon set tends to go aside the scheduler. So it runs on the nodes and it's, so it binds directly to the node and bypasses the scheduler, which is what it's meant to do, but it's bad for, I mean, you run into, we run into weird issues at thousand nodes, for example. 
uh, I have here not like the. So, why is this important? If it's bypassing the scheduler, uh, you have like let's say you deploy like kinds. It's a daemon set, and <coughs> daemon sets also ignore. They 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 can ignore the unschedulable nodes. They can they don't care about. I mean the way it's designed. It will de be deployed in these nodes as well. So <coughs> you just define the spec of the daemon set. It's running. It binds to the node before every any other service is running. Uh, but there is a software throttle as well here in the code, which I have. So there's a limit performance requirements in, in Kubernetes in the, the replication controller and the daemon set and in the replica set, which is, let's say, it's being next uh, as the replication controller, which is like 500. And this was already like a corner case. Uh, one of our scheduler experts, Timothy St. Clair, uh, found out that we were constantly having issues and where, where the, let's say, OC, uh, the OC command would just stop responding in a timely fashion. It was just super slow. And uh, so we noticed because of this, because of this throttle, uh, there, there was we were having a lot of contention, and we had we were basically swarming a cluster. So if there's a limit like 500 burst replicas, you will have like uh, constant time swarming of a huge cluster, right? So like step. From from 0 to 500 in uh, constant time, which was bringing the cluster to its knees, basically. So as I said, uh, daemon sets are used to run uh, a, a daemon or a pod on every node. In this case, the logging pods. Uh, so the, the, it's a perfect use case for this, for the logging project. So it's just you have your sharded data store in your cluster. You run a logger on every node, and you have you have your applications tied to the API server, Kubernetes load services. This always there is always. Uh, watches involved, right? So persistent connections to the, to the, the API server. And uh, this, this, this tends to, I mean, get more important at, 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 at real large scale. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a point to, especially since logging is deployed using labels, you label, you label this, you label the nodes you want for this kind of project and for with using the, FluentD node selector. Uh, this will be this will be uh, important. How do you change the limit? How do you change the limit of the user interface for the cluster? Well, when it's deployed already in, in use in use, you yeah, can. Or for if you're deploying a new cluster, and you need to optimize it. So. Uh, from OpenShift, if you're talking about the OpenShift cluster, it's usually in the configuration, like in the master config or in the node config, master config or YAML. <coughs> so this is still kind of in the control plane, <coughs> but we de developed tools to go to the, the underlying cluster and try to stretch Elasticsearch. We work closely, closely with the developers, like to try and understand what's the best way of doing it. And eventually, at a large enough scale, so at, uh, I will explain better what this is later because I need to ex I need to talk about the the test itself, the throughput test. But at fi 50 logger pods, uh, close to 205 nodes running, uh, logging uh, 256 bytes ping per second, you we reach the internal queues capacity of Elasticsearch. So this is something that's, well, it's normal because there are really a lot of pods logging, but we need to know that this happens and try to 
talk with the developers and fix it somehow, right? Most recently, we have also hit the Fluent D buffer chunk limits, uh, which was kind of taking the problem of Elasticsearch and placing it in Fluent D now. Because so Elastic is now without any limits being reached, or most of the limits, like there is no thread, thread pool or active pools in the, during the test. But then we, we fill up the, the memory buffers in Fluent D. So the, lo the logging test uh, that we developed, it's kind of an all-in-one because it's it's not using Q it's not using OpenShift scheduling and uh, it's not leveraging the what's important like having metadata about all of these pods running. It's it's kind of doing stress testing and. Embedding, embedding pbench to get the, the data from all the all the all the components like we get we get data from I mean the java processes and from fluent pods we get we get all this kind of data if, for for s if you don't know pbench it's a distributed analysis like performance tool uh, which basically wraps uh, you know like FIO uh, and other common tools like stress and uh, perf. It's extensible and it's, it can be run remotely. You can point it to like three different computers, three different nodes, and collect data from those nodes. And then they say PBench sends the data back to your to your central node. Then you can review it. Like generate generates graphs as well, so you can make comparisons and fine-tune things. So it's it's uh, used, this test is used to load up a cluster with logging traffic at certain rates, at certain scales, and wraps pbench while it's running. And it's also possible to pass other drivers as well, because underneath is just Docker, it's a Docker run, mounting dev log, passing the dev log to the container, and using a, a particular image and a particular rate. So still like focusing on Elasticsearch, uh, we, we, do, we delete. This was also a recommendation from, from developers. Like we should start from a clean state, delete the indices in the start, the start of the test, uh, get all the kinds of data, stat statistics through Elastic's API, REST API, capture disk usage, then we s then it generates the load uh, as we want, as I explained before. It by default it registers this this uh, tools IOSTAT and PSTAT. We tend to look more at PSTAT just for keep track of what's happening in the processes. SAR is also useful for uh, disk data analysis, like more fine grained. So and. After one hour, which is the default duration of the test, it optimizes and flushes indexes. I think this is a recommendation from upstream, like from, well, not upstream, elastic in this case, and where you, where you keep the, you clean up your shards and indices. I don't, I don't know the, the details, but it's, in the end you end up with the more organized, with the shards more organized. This is what pbench gives us in the end. So this is like, this is kind of a micro benchmark, which we are really stressing. So it's just 10 nodes and two, 2K per second <coughs> during 300 seconds. And as you see the Java process, like it's, it's really consuming a lot of CPU. We see system D also a bit like stressed, but the the Java the Java process is really the although it's a short test, but it's already meaningful. You can see what's happening. This is a longer test. So at uh, 205 nodes and 30 worker pods per node. So like during one hour and we can see what happens, like the amount of writes and k rate per second. Yeah. 
So I just have a couple of short videos. before passing to, to Elko to talk about metrics. So this is like, we have videos of this. I mean, we don't have the, the big cluster available now. So we are just, this is logging and running. Three, three, three elastic search pods. 200 fluent Ds. Meanwhile, the test harness is running, saving all the logs and f flooding the cluster. And you can you can see what's happening in the scheduler and the API server. Actually, these are 250 daemon sets because this is a split fluent D configuration, something we've been testing recently, uh, where we have enricher fluent Ds and dispatchers. So this is a 250 node cluster. This is the, the, the cluster actually being loaded <laughs> with pods. And uh, it's, uh, since there's a big amount of a big amount of nodes, it takes some time. But uh, you can see more or less the output of the testing tool up where it saves everything I described before and collects the disk widgets. I just pointed <coughs> to the region info nodes because we are interested in knowing what's happening with Elastic. So this is basically pbench uh, registering against the infra nodes. And so there is two 20 enrichment fluent Ds and uh, 200 fluent to 200 fluent D normal pods running. You can see the cluster stage elastic search is in green state. So it's like we gathered this data across time. So just some takeaways from this testing. Uh, <coughs> if you ever have to install OpenShift in a large enough cluster, and you start reading that I mean, some project uh, in particular, you start thinking that you should use labels and node selectors. Uh, be careful because this can bring, like, cause a lot of traffic in your cluster. Just imagining 500 pods at once pulling the images from a registry and being scheduled and uh, everything running at the same time. So th it's recommended like you pre-pulled all the fluent, the, all the images, in this case fluent D images, and you set the image pool policy to if not present. And you should label, you should label your nodes in, in batches. Never use like label nodes all, dash dash all, right? So this will not cause that burst that I talked before, so like, Things are done more, let's say, smoothly, let's say. And you, you can also keep track of what's happening, like if there are some image pool errors, just or some pods going to failed state, or you need to know what's happening and debug it as you are scaling up. So this crash loop back off issues happen at scale quite often. Match node select. Match node selector, it's, uh, it's uh, related to the scheduler predicates, and, and but it's not so common and it should be fixed. So still you should use labels and selectors and daemon sets if necessary to differentiate like your infrastructure from your application nodes and use persistent volumes for your infrastructure nodes. In this case, elastic search and metrics if you're, if you're going to deploy this. Uh, I will pass now 
word to Elko to talk about. Ah, sorry. Excuse me. Yeah. No, no. We didn't test that, no. Like using a different, uh, no, we didn't test. Right. Uh, more questions, no. So. for logging thing of open shift so I'm going to show the, the stuff regarding the open shift metrics and uh, what to pay attention when configuring it for a quite bigger clusters and uh, that's uh, our limits. Uh, I'm, mm, as Ricardo in the performance team, uh, my name is Olivier Kuric, and yeah, that's in short about me. Uh, so OpenShift metrics, uh, at the time, there are three components in the OpenShift metrics. Uh, uh, Cassandra uh, serves as the data store. So everything that is collected from the op OpenShift, uh, uh, OpenShift pods is written in Cassandra, how clear is uh, metric storage engine and heapster is the thing which is collecting data from the pods, from the OpenShift nodes uh, actually including the pods. Uh, so, how we will start, uh, overview could be like this, so heapster reach the, the kubelets, uh, pass that information to the half clar and uh, uh, that is written to the Cassandra. It also provides the half clar console which uh, users can later on use uh, to see information over the web interface, actually that is a sub uh, web interface of uh, OpenShift uh, console. And when everything is works, is it shows you graphs like this. Uh, so I just wanted uh, at the beginning to show you what is the end result and now I'm going uh, to go how we reach to this position. So at the time, uh, if something is not changed recently, it is showing on the graphs uh, memory, CPU, and network throughput uh, uh, for last hour, last 30 minutes, last four hours. Uh, it collects more information and uh, possible to parse it somehow uh, over the API, but uh, on the graphs, uh, it shows something like this. Uh, all metrics components are delivered as uh, pods, so Cassandra, Hipster, and Havkula are just pods, uh, and uh, uh, we release the, uh, these, these pods are released quite often uh, with different uh, versions or subversions uh, of uh, specific uh, specific images. And uh, the main so-called place where is uh, specified the most of these configuration options is metrics.yaml on upstream. In upstream repository you can find it, uh, it is quite long file. Uh, I will point out a couple values from it which one needs to pay attention. Uh, so, yeah. Now I will tell you a bit more about all these uh, 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 metric pods. So Cassandra pod is, as I said, it uses, uh, it is uses as a main da data store for, uh, for all data collected from the, uh, from the uh, OpenShift uh, pods and uh, by default it uses persistent use persistent storage true that means uh, uh, it will look for persistent volume on the uh, on the on the available to you to use it uh, for the uh, Cassandra data it's going to mount it to the Cassandra uh, root Cassandra data 
and uh, we recommend to use that because that ensures that you have a data persistence across uh, uh, Cassandra pod lifetime. Um, it is possible to scale out more Cassandra pods and uh, one can say uh, stack three Cassandra pods. I said, yeah, these pods are actually nodes, Cassandra nodes, that means uh, when one starts more Cassandra pods, when we need more Cassandra pods in the background, they form uh, Cassandra clusters. So uh, the technology you have, and which is related to the usual Cassandra clusters can be deployed here as well. If one decide to use persistent storage pools, then uh, that uh, it means uh, no data persistence. And uh, uh, if you are using older version of OpenShift or Kubernetes, then uh, this option can lead that uh, varlib origin pods is, and if it's, uh, let's say, not separate partition, it can cause you troubles because it's going to fill that over time. In that problem is reported and already fixed upstream and downstream, so now it should not happen. But uh, previously that was. However, it was good uh, to monitor varlib origin, but uh, for the metrics, it would be good not to use persistent storage pools. That's, uh, however, our recommendation. So hipster component uh, gathers metrics from uh, OpenShift uh, cluster. It gets metrics from every pod across all namespaces for what it needs uh, read, uh, read uh, writes to do that and send this data to the whole cloud metrics of the API. That is from GitHub without any corrections, I cannot say further. So how to set up well, OpenShift metrics configuration is quite easy. And uh, in my work, uh, I think starting OpenShift metrics worked in almost all cases. Uh, I think I put here the link, not correct link, but anyway. Uh, configuration is quite easy, just uh, entered a couple commands, which I uh, intentionally left here because uh, you can read that in documentation as well and I don't think we have enough time. Uh, that's the first option. Second option is using Ansible playbook or advanced installer. So a lot of these are documented in this link. We can add more Cassandra pods and more Hawklar pods. Uh, at the time, I think uh, only one hipster is recommended and can run per cluster and that is particularly a problem. Uh, OpenShift metrics uh, uh, supports dynamic provisioning of storage. That means if uh, uh, OpenShift uh, cluster is configured uh, to use a, a cloud uh, provider, no matter is it uh, Amazon or we, we support at the time, I think, uh, for, the, for the cluster as well, it will automatically uh, uh, allocate allocate storage at the storage storage backend and attach to the Cassandra. Uh, it is recommended to have a dedicated pods, uh, dedicated nodes for the OpenShift uh, OpenShift metrics, and uh, uh, the thing is. Uh, these, uh, these uh, pods usually uh, should end on the infra nodes for better, better planning. Uh, recommendation is to put them on the infra nodes, but can be also different depending on decisions. Mm. When uh, OpenShift pods are running, then uh, OpenShift metrics pods are running, then uh, uh, in my test, I didn't notice that uh, Cassandra or how Clara heaps are imposing 
on, uh, uh, on, the, on the OpenShift node when they run uh, some uh, excessively high load. And uh, I noticed that, uh, I mean, I, I proved that one set of metrics puts, that means one Cassandra, one Heapster, and one Haukular are able to handle without any problems 10 or even 10,000 pods. So this can serve as just guidelines uh, for, uh, for deployment. Uh, this worked fine. Also, so if it necessary to monitor more than 10,000 pods, uh, I would recommend to scale out the number of Havkulars and Cassandras. And uh, also for uh, Cassandra, uh, it is a not good player with uh, NFS or network shared storage, network storage. Uh, that is not a official, st uh, official thing I can say not to run it NFS because people run it on NFS but it can lead to the, uh, to the problems uh, with the uh, money price. Uh, the at the time, there is no limitation in the sense or because uh, if there is a persistent volume uh, available on, on OpenShift system, uh, it is going to be used for metrics. If we use persistent storage is true and the uh, no matter what is a, from where that uh, persistent volume is coming. So it can be uh, also from NFS. Uh, just heads up uh, with uh, high load, NFS might not be the best option, but uh, I know that uh, I think quite a lot of people, some estimation says around 50% of users uh, are using NFS as a main uh, uh, network storage, network parties. Uh, OpenShift metrics uh, uh, was successfully installed and run on uh, 200 and 210 and 981 cluster, uh, nodes cluster. Uh, that means it uh, works fine with such big clusters. Uh, it, uh, is able to collect the data from the pods scattered across all these nodes. And uh, uh, we have noticed that uh, for 1,000 pods, uh, Cassandra storage requirement across one day, during one day, is approximately 2.5 gigabytes. And if uh, we keep default uh, metrics duration, what is seven days? And with metrics resolution of 50 seconds, that would uh, be safe to say to allocate 4,000 pods around 20 gigabytes of data per week, approximately. Or giving just there, for example, 10% buffer in case something uh, is not correct in this my calculation. For the 10,000 pods, uh, it requires a bit more space. Everything this is uh, for uh, matrix duration seven days and matrix resolution 50 seconds. Uh, you mean, what? can you repeat please? Yeah, Hipster is, is reaching uh, out to the OpenShift, uh, OpenShift nodes, Kubelets. And uh, I, I think 50 seconds, every 50 seconds it's reached. And this is possible to, to change. Is that what metrics resolution is? How often Heapster goes out? I think so. Okay. And uh, 50, uh, 50 seconds is at the time value there, but uh, someone may need to increase that. Mm, this was everything up to 10,000 pots, 11,000 pots, or even 12,000 pots. But if we add more pots, 
in, inside the OpenShift cluster. Uh, then at one point of time, it is going uh, to cause the troubles that uh, actually that point is uh, around 12,000 pods. It could be even higher a bit. Uh, that uh, hipster will not properly or will not be able to handle all these pods and uh, data collection will not work as suspected. Uh, we have Bugzilla for this problem and uh, issues identified. Uh, we have some improvements uh, which needs to be tested so soon uh, based on, and, um, based on, on concurrency and uh, in the hipster itself. So, but that's still not the mm, expected behavior. Uh, hopefully in the future releases, we'll have uh, better information. Um, there is recent project, research, recent uh, blog from the Halklar team who specified this monitoring microservices on Hosa, Halklar OpenShift agent. And the uh, idea is to rework uh, the way how metrics is collected at the time. Uh, this is uh, possible to test. You, if you go to this link, you will find instructions how to play, <laughs> how to play with this uh, and see uh, what, what is uh, new in the open, what's going to be new in the OpenShift uh, metrics. Uh, metrics. So the, the at the time, OpenShift metrics uh, is uh, quite, quite good uh, in running on, let's say, quite big clusters. Uh, 980 nodes. Mm, the only you know, small trouble which at the time is with a quite high number of, uh, of pods. Uh. Okay, that's all the slides I have uh, for this presentation. I will now stop and give you time to ask a question if you have something. Yes, please. Uh, I think it is uh, possible to start more, okay. but uh, then they are going to operate on the same same beats. So, <coughs> the, well, yeah. Oh, you mean they'll operate on the same pod? Yeah. So you can't say, uh, I want this heapster to talk to pods that are labeled with this label, and I want this heapster to talk to pods labeled with this label. And sort of divide I up. have had such ideas, <laughs> but uh, also got uh, in discussion with the guys who are developers for this uh, metrics that uh, actually one hipster is uh, the way we, we can do it now. And the hipster is at the time or bottleneck in all this story. Hopefully, yeah, go ahead. Uh, hipster reached to the, the, to the kublet uh, uh, because uh, their C advisor exposing. Uh, okay. So, yeah. Right. No problem. Yes, please. Uh, I cannot answer you. I didn't, I, I didn't, I didn't uh, compare. The question was uh, how OpenShift metrics compare to the Prometheus. I really, I, I would like to, to do sm some testing in regarding that, but I did not myself. Yes. Me or to him? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, we usually just. Uh, as far as I know, no. 
I mean, we, we didn't do a lot of testing on the NFS. Uh, so and it's mostly because it's not recommended, but we will have to do it because there are many uh, customers with uh, large sends and, you know, and uh, net apps and all from, from, and they have really fast, really fast NFS back storage. And this could be a, could be an idea, but we don't have testing data for that. Yeah. So just recommended is like just to try and pull the images, either using Ansible, you know, an Ansible role, like, for example. Are there any more quest questions for either for logging or for, for metrics? If not, uh, we can always talk uh, after. So uh, I think we can just conclude and thank you for attending. Thank you very much. Yes, thanks guys.